Good morning, everyone. We're going to invite you to take your seats and settle in to prepare for worship on the first Sunday of a brand new month. A reminder to all of us that last week was Easter Sunday, and so we are in the season called, obviously, Easter season. And I hope and pray that as we continue to gather and worship each and every Sunday, that we are reminded that Easter is not just a one-day event, but we are called to live as Easter people, people of the resurrection. So my hope and prayer is that we go forward that we will be reminded of that and that will cause us to not only worship God uh, more faithfully, but to strive to live as his people. So let's begin with a moment of silence as we prepare for holy worship today. Please join me in our call to worship, and the words are on the screen before you. <clears throat> we gather with joy, for Easter continues. We celebrate the presence of the risen Christ among us. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us worship God, let us pray together. God of new life, we come to you rejoicing in the mystery of the risen Christ, present among us always, even when we least expect him. We marvel at your constant love, your victory over death, and your resurrecting hope which embraces us in every circumstance. Trusting in these gifts, we seek to live as Easter people in every time and place. Fill us with the gift of your Holy Spirit in this time of worship and grant us your peace through Christ, our risen Savior. Friends, even as we delight in Easter's promise, let us together confess the ways we fail to live it out with this prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess our trust in you can weaken, and we become anxious about many things. We talk about love, but fear those who differ from us. We cling to our personal agendas and neglect your call to serve others, especially when that service costs us something. Forgive us. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, rekindle our passion for you, so we can witness to your love in all we do. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we gather in worship in this season called Easter, hear the words of the risen Christ. He says to you and I, peace be with you. Receive the peace and forgiveness of Christ and share that peace with one another this day and every day. Amen. With that in our hearts, we invite our praise team forward as they lead us in song. And afterwards, our elder today, Helen Lee, will come forward and lead us in prayer. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to another Sunday, first April, Sunday of April, as we anticipate the big event, the solar eclipse. So. Don't look at the sun too long. <laughs> Don't look at it at all, actually, unless you got the proper uh, eyewear. Um, one of the earliest Hillsong songs I've heard was Mighty to Save, and it's, um, it's a song about um, 
how mighty our Savior is, that he can move mountains, but mostly that he can save us, save us from death, give us salvation, and conquer the grave. Um, so I invite you all to stand if you're able. Our next song is a, a song that has a beautiful part that the ladies uh, echo. Um, and I invite you, all the ladies to join in that echo. That's called, uh, Lord, You Have My Heart.
Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice, and I will praise you, Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and lift our prayers to you. We lift up Amy's mother to, lo to you, Lord, who is recovering in the hospital in Hong Kong from her recent stroke. God, please grant true healing to her with continuous improvement in her swallowing skill and positive reaction to the new medication. May she receive effective medical treatment in the hospital. Please grant strength and stamina and calmness to Amy's family who are providing loving care to her in Hong Kong. We are thankful that Amy has returned safely in Canada. We pray for her good health and general well-being. We lift up Paul's mom to you, Lord. We pray that her pain is manageable, and that she will endure less suffering. May you comfort her with the joy of spending quality time with Paul and her family as they pay frequent visits to her in the retirement home. May Paul's mother continue to trust in you, Lord. Please grant her with peace and strength, both physically and emotionally. We pray for Carol, who has recently fallen and hurt her knee. We pray for her speedy recovery with minimum pain. We also pray for Carol's sister, Tin, who has recently been discharged from the hospital after a surgery due to bowel obstruction. We are thankful for the proper treatment of her complications and infections by the medical professionals. We pray for her complete healing from diarrhea and that she will return to her normal body functions. May God provide mental and physical strength and patience for both Carol and her sister during this challenging time. We pray for Kristen, Christine 
Danny and her two young children, who are currently in Taiwan, visiting their family. We are thankful to hear that they are safe and sound amidst the horrific earthquake which happened in Taiwan this past Wednesday. Although they were scared and felt the earthquake with everything shaking, nothing was damaged and no one was hurt. We pray for their continued safety and God's protection. Unfortunately, there are many others who are impacted by the powerful magnitude 7.4 earthquake which happened in um, Guilin, uh, in Taiwan on Wednesday. This is the island's worst earthquake in 25 years. More than 600 people are still stranded three days after the earthquake in various locations cut off by the damage and waiting for rescue. The aftershock continues, death toll is rising, thousands are injured, and the scores are still missing. We pray for the recovery of casualties. May God bless those who mourn and bless the disaster responders with safety, protection, and successful rescue efforts. Dear merciful Lord, in this time of natural disaster, surround all these Taiwanese people who are affected by this horrific earthquake with your grace and peace. By your spirit, lift up those victims who have fallen and injured. Sustain those who work to rescue and rebuild, and fill us with the hope of your new creation and in your uniting families. Tomorrow, Monday, April 8th, is a special day as we witness the upcoming solar eclipse. Canada's Niagara region has declared a state of emergency as it prepares for millions of people tourists. We pray that the expected traffic jams will not cause major car accidents and that the potential heavier demands for emergency services will be effectively managed and that the cell phone network will not be overloaded. Tomorrow is a PA day for schools. We pray that everyone, especially the curious children who is planning to view the solar eclipse, be wearing protective glasses and that their eyes will not be hurt by the sun. Almighty God, we are amazed and grateful for your magnificent creation in the solar system. May you grant us safety, protect our eyes, grant us clear sky with minimal clouds as we look forward to witness this special event tomorrow. May the joy of the Lord be your strength and his peace and love surround you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Helen. Let's dismiss our children to Sunday school. As I do so, let me just uh, bring up some announcements to you. Uh, please do remember that we do send out the newsletter uh, twice a week for you to know what's happening in our church family. Um, the next few months, there's a lot of things happening, so we hope that you will take note of those important dates and mark your calendar. Uh, for me, I just want to remind you that the Session of Elders are meeting for our monthly meeting this coming Tuesday in person at the church center. So please, if you remember us, please remember us in prayer as well. At this time, I'm going to invite um, Mary and Anne up forward. They're going to give you an announcement. Hey, Anne, so I hear there's a special event coming up. Tell me a little bit about it. Mary, you may say it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity coming up. Wow, really? That sounds super exciting. Tell me, tell me more. Well, a lot of people will be gathering together 
and it will be tough to secure a spot for mm -hmm. it. There may be some bright lights, as bright as the sun or moon, and you may even be able to wear funky glasses to join in. I know what you're talking about. The Taylor Swift Eras Tour, right? That's what it is. Because, you know, it's so hard to get one of those tickets. I, I couldn't. Um, the closest I got was really watching it on Disney Plus, but I do remember in the folklore era, there was that moon in the backdrop. That's what you're talking about, right? That is an amazing concert, but no, that's not oh. what I'm talking about. For this event, you need to go to the west side of town to experience it, and you may need another type of glasses. Oh, right. Just as Helen prayed about the solar eclipse. Yeah, you gotta go to Niagara Falls to see that. This is really dark. I can't see anything. That's what you're talking about, right? Those are celestial glasses indeed. But no, those are for just the solar eclipse. Both are big events, but does the solar eclipse offer you three meals and all the snacks throughout the events? Mm, no. Does the T Taylor Swift concert allow you to stay overnight in your own personal room with your own toilet and sink? Oh, no, no. Does the solar eclipse allow you to be together with up to 25 other women from Celebration Church? Oh, no, no, I no. don't think so. No, no, yeah, I know what you're talking about. What might even be better than hanging out with a whole bunch of Swifties might be better than being able to see, or not see, but the, partially, the, the solar eclipse out on the West End is joining us for the women's retreat at the Queen of Apostle um, Renewal Center in Mississauga. It'll be on July 6th and 7th over the weekend. And as, as Anne said, you'll get accommodations for that one night. It starts Saturday at 9 a.m. until 3.30 on Sunday. We'll have an opportunity though to really enjoy the, the outdoors. Um, you'll get a chance to wear perhaps your sunglasses um, and enjoy the sun and be at bask in not only the warmth of the sun, but be with the Son of God. And in that, we'll also perhaps also be able to re use our reading glasses um, to dig into the Bible and read his word as well. So it'll be a really great time. Um, you'll be able to, to get home in time for dinner with the family on Sunday, and we will be live streaming this Sunday worship service on that seventh um, of the month. Anything else you can tell me about it? Um, there is a limited number of rooms available, around 25. Um, but for the cost of this great weekend together, it'll be only $170 per person. And remember, that includes Saturday dinner, Sunday breakfast and lunch, and snacks and coffee and tea and water. Um, we plan to carpool to Mississauga, so if you need a ride, please let us know, or if you can offer rides to others, let us know that. Um, checks are to be made payable to Celebration Presbyterian Church and to be for $170, um, given to me by May the 6th. That sounds great. Um, and so folks, right, you can contact Anne or myself, and as well as Becky Chung, um, if you need any details or have any other questions about it, we'll definitely be there. And so we're looking forward to having um, time with all of the women, just being in the, the um, having a radiant, relaxing and rejuvenating weekend. So we hope to see you there. Thanks. Thank you. That was very clever, wasn't it? Yeah, when I, I got the uh, email detailing what they're going to do, and I responded to Anne. That's clever. Yeah, that's good. Great. And Mary, thank you. Yeah. If you have further questions, yes, please do talk to uh, Becky, Anne, or Mary. I invite you now to turn to the, your Bibles, um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to verse 17, as we embark on a, a new teaching series starting today. Um, 
And as you do so, as you find your way there, I'm just give you a little prompt of what we're planning or what I'm trying to do for the next uh, four or five weeks or so. Um, as the minister of the church, I've been just thinking about what's been happening the last few months or so. Uh, first of all, kick off with the, uh, the young adults. They were doing uh, a study from the Tough Question series. Um, Eric, remind me, was it how do we know God exists or was it how do we know all religions lead to God? Which one was it? God exists, right? I missed last time. No, no, no. <laughs> this, was, this was a few weeks ago. I know you were away in Texas, but this was way back when. Emma might know. <laughs> no, but I don't see, I don't see Mark. I didn't, is Mark here? Yeah, Mark's not here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they did a, they did a tough question series about, um, I, I think it was, how do you know that God exists? And then after that, I, I heard about Becky and Amy doing their newcomers group, and they were trying to ask questions about basics of faith. How do we know about this is true or whatnot? And then soon after that, Sam and Linda, who are joining us in worship today, they offered workshop. And how, how, do, we, how do we share our faith with others? And so I'm th- looking forward to Easter, and then I think the timing is correct. So I'm going to give it to um, credit God's providence in this. And so I invite you, as we have celebrated Easter last Sunday, uh, it's my two cents to encourage you um, through this series. Uh, Today will be a kickoff to um, uh, the real series, which begins next week for about four weeks. And we're going to look at the question, the God question. What is that question? But we'll, we'll, I hope that it will make sense by the way we go. So it's, it's not going to be a teaching series per se where we look at passage and we dig into the scriptures and find God's word. It wouldn't be an exposition as I, as I normally try to do. Uh, but these will be verses just to kind of get our minds on the topic. And then by the end of the teaching, I hope that it makes sense. So Colossians 1, verse 15 to verse 17. The word of God for the people of God as we gather in holy worship on the first Sunday of the new month of April as we continue our journey as Easter people, people of the resurrection. Paul writes and he says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a book that came out many, many years ago, and for those of you who are similar age from me, you will recognize it, but it's been such a good and best-selling book that it's been updated throughout uh, the years, and um, the newest one is written by uh, not only himself, but his son, who is a PhD down in the States. That book is called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. This is an award-winning book by Christian apologist Josh McDowell, you may know that name, and the newest one is done by his son, Sean McDowell, who is a professor down in the States of Christian apologetics. Apologetics is just a fancy word of a reasoned defense of the faith. That's what it means. Uh, So they are Christian apologists well known throughout the world. This book is a compilation of facts and notes and articles about the veracity or the truthfulness of Christianity. It's a very simple book to read. It's laid out in pretty um, straightforward fashion. But the authors basically say this, their main point, so to speak. This is what we know to be true, audience, readers. This is what we know to be true. You draw your conclusion. We just present what we know to be true. You reach your own verdict based on the evidence that we have presented. Here's my invitation for today on this side of the empty tomb as we are challenged to live as Easter people, people of the resurrection, Here's a challenge to anyone interested in Christianity, but not yet convinced. I would say the same thing, and that is, take a close look at both sides of the question. 
I invite you, scrutinize it to your heart's content. Be as objective as possible, and in the end, make your own decision. Make your own decision about what you believe about Jesus Christ. And I can freely with confidence say that because here is something that you may not hear often enough. That is because our faith, Christianity, is not a blind leap of faith into the dark. And some of us, may, we may hear that from family and friends and co-workers. How can you be so dumb to believe in Christianity? Christianity is not a blind leap of faith into the dark, where you try to convince yourself, you talk yourself into believing things that really have no evidence to back it up. Instead, Christianity is a step of faith, I admit that, but it is an enlightened step of faith into the light. It is not a blind leap of faith into darkness. It is an enlightened step of faith into the light. That means that our core beliefs, they are not myths. They're not legends. They are not based on ancient folklore. Our core beliefs are based on eyewitness accounts of real historical events and we have very good reasons to believe that those accounts that we are speaking of are accurate and reliable. Let's paint the landscape. Here in the West, for the last 30 plus years or so, there's been a shift in ideology. More and more people are uh, becoming unaffiliated with any kind of religion. More and more people are identifying themselves as non-religious. More and more people are, in fact, even saying, I am an atheist. I am an atheist. In fact, the, the new, quote, atheism movement is spreading rapidly, and it seems to be gaining momentum. Leading spokesmen, such as Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennant, and the late Christopher Hutchins. Collectively, these three guys, they're known as the, they're referred to as the four horsemen. And I get a kick out of that. You know, the, if you read Revelation, there's the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? So these guys are known as, or nicknamed, the four horsemen. These men have made, they have sold millions and millions of books. Titles such as, here's a good one, The God Delusion. Another one, God is not great. Another one says, the end of faith, and so on and so on. So atheism, these are selling millions and millions of books. So atheism is becoming a bit trendy. Those who call themselves religiously unaffiliated, they're called nuns, nuns. N-O-N-E-S, none, as in none of the above. They're called nons. They are part of a rapidly growing demographic. Some find this very concerning. But believe it or not, it can actually be a very good thing, and here's why. It is often said in those who are in ministry, like myself, it is often said that the people who are hardest to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ, do you know who they are? The people who are hardest to reach with the truth of Jesus Christ are those who are sort of connected to organized religion. You know, they have a half-hearted belief in God. They're marginally religious who kind of believe in Jesus. They go to church when they go, but they, it's really out of sheer habit. It's what I do on a Sunday morning who think they're going to heaven, why? Because they have a membership in some church office somewhere. It's hard to tell them about Jesus, why? Because they think they're already saved. But when a person calls themselves, quote, unaffiliated, and they come out right out and say it, 
you know, I have nothing to hide. It's the truth. I have no church. I have no religion. I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in God. So on and so on and so on. Then at least that person is honest and knows where he or she they stand. They know where they stand in relationship to Christianity, in relationship to what it means to follow Jesus Christ. They're not fooling themselves. They know where they stand. They're not fooling themselves like so many semi-religious people are. Today, I invite you on a journey. And today, as a kickoff, I want us to consider the, this whole idea of believing in God versus not believing in God. Is there a rational justification for either of them? Is there a rational justification for either belief? And if so, then which one makes the most sense? I'm pretty sure you can guess what my conclusion will be, right? Hopefully, right? I can tell you why I believe in God, and I can tell you I am firmly convinced in my faith, but here's the thing. I can also tell you this. My certainty about the existence of God is not sufficient for anyone else. I know that from experience, and from just thinking it through. My certainty about the existence of God is not sufficient. It's not enough for anyone else. Everyone must come to their own decision, their own conclusion about their belief in God's existence or his non-existence. And everyone must own that conclusion. Wherever you land, you must own that conclusion. You must be ready to own it. And what does that mean? What is the fallout of that? What does that mean for my life? Just about every person that I know well enough, uh, including the most solid, the most steadfast of believers, the truth is this. Even the strongest Christians, so to speak, they have struggled at some point with questions about the existence of God. Now, if if you have never doubted the question, never doubted or questioned God's existence, then, hey, good for you. Good for you, really. Good for you. But if you have, for the rest of us, probably all of us, if not the majority of us, if you have had doubts about God's existence, here's what I say to you. Good for you. Good for you. It's my invitation to you. Good for you. Why? Because those questions can be answered. And here's the promise. Once they have been answered for you, your faith will be stronger than ever. Here's what I I believe. A faith that is not tested is weak faith. A faith that is untested is weak faith. But I want you to know something. Christianity is strong enough to withstand any questions that you can throw at it. In 2,000 plus years, no one has asked a question that destroyed Christianity for everyone. For some of you, even after following Jesus for many years, perhaps now you're in the time of place of your faith journey or life journey, you are challenging. You are questioning every belief that you've previously accepted without reservation, especially if you've grown up into the church, in the church, such as, what do I really believe about the Bible? What do I really believe about Jesus? What do I believe about church? What do I believe about the existence of God? And so on and so on and so on. You may be asking those questions. Oh, my father, my mother is an elder of the church. My, my, how can I ask those kinds of questions? I would embarrass my family, whatever. Here, here, here's my invitation. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Don't be ashamed. Good for you. But please, don't stop at just asking the question. I would urge you 
to take the next step, enter a time or a season of searching and testing. Because it will help you determine once and for all what you really believe. And I'm not going to presume where you're going to land, here or there. But your faith will go from something that you inherited. Oh, I went through Sunday school, youth group, you know. You inherited that belief or that faith. And you move into something much, much profound and exciting. It becomes your own. Everybody needs to go through this process. Everybody. This is why the Apostle Peter said this, and this is a verse that we'll reference uh, throughout the next few weeks. Peter writes and he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Peter is saying that you and I, we need to know what we believe, but not only that, why you believe it. It has to go both. You can't have one or with the other or else it, it's in, incomplete. I mean, I admit, you can get some of these answers in a book. You can, you can read a book, but really, I invite you to do something much more deeper and personal and profound. You can get some of these answers from a book, but really, they need to take root in your heart. In your heart. They must become profoundly personal for you. And that's why books like the one I referenced, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, or perhaps you know a book called The Case for Christ, or a classic, Mere Christianity, and so many other ones. These are why these books are so important. Not because they tell you what to think, but because they challenge you to think for yourself. To look at the issue from both sides, and hey, You make up your mind. Come to your conclusion. Today, again, let's start from point zero. I'm going to offer my two cents. Let's talk about atheism, theism. Because if you ever had doubts about the existence of God, or if you know someone who's challenging this very idea, this is the first question that you must answer. This is the first question that must be answered. At this point, the question is not which religion is the right religion, which church is the right church. The question at this point is not even what kind of God is God? What is God like? That is not even the question. The question to begin with in one's journey to faith is to ask simply this, does it make sense? Does it make more sense to believe in God or not believe in God? Which one makes more sense? Many people give the impression that you really only have two options in belief. And that is you can be, you know, Stop being a dumb Christian. You know, we live in a modern era, right? So you are, you, your choice is you are a smart, um, enlightened atheist or you're a hateful fundamentalist because you go to church. And that is not true at all. That is so not true. True, in the spectrum of theism, notice I'm not even saying Christianity. In the spectrum of theism, there are a thousand different landing points. So the first question is not which which religion is right or which church is right. Is the Bible really God's word? The first question is, will I put my faith, and you ought to know what faith means by now, belief, trust, action. Will I put my faith in the idea that God exists, or will I put my faith, my belief, my trust, my action, my life, in the idea that God does not exist? If we were to listen to what atheists say and read what they write, there's usually a pattern. Um, Generally speaking, 
There are three kinds of atheists in the world, three kinds. You'll be on the screen. The first one is those who became an atheist for emotional reasons, emotional reasons. Uh, let me just unpack that for you. So a typical person would be they grew up in church, but they hated it. Oh, mom and dad drags me to church every single Sunday, and it's boring. Um, they hated the hypocrisy they see at church. And even at home, mom and dad are like two different people. They're like this at church, but then like this at home. They, they see the hypocrisy and they hate that. Or they, they know a minister, they know a preacher who just makes too much money and, hey, he ran away with a secretary. Or perhaps they grew up and went to a Catholic school, a parochial school, and that nun was so mean, she would always hit us with the ruler. Or they know religious people who are so judgmental. Why are so-called good people, religious people, so judgmental and so unfriendly? And so on and so on and so on. So they finally come to that conclusion. They finally say, if that's what Christianity is, no thank you. I don't want anything to do with it. And in their mind, they think that they only have two options. Two options. Hateful, hypocritical religion, or, hey man, get with it, modern, enlightened atheism. Two choices, so they choose atheism. Fun fact, this is the reason why Marilyn Manson, if you know this, oh, he's a, he's a crazy dude, right? This is the reason why Marilyn Manson gave for being an atheist. Did you know that he grew up in a church? But he had a very bad experience growing up in church in his home state of Ohio. So that led him to that conclusion that Christianity cannot be true. God does not exist. It's very interesting. Many people who are atheists for emotional reasons, they become very bitter. They become very bitter at this God who they insist is not real. God does not exist, but they're so very bitter at this God who they say does not exist. For example, a British novelist, his name is Kingsley Ames, he was once asked this question, is it true, sir, that you do not believe in God? His answer, quote, that is true, but it's more than that. I hate him. Do you see how odd that is? Some people become atheists because of emotional reasons. Others become an atheist as a result of a bad experience or a failed experience, failed experience. Um, a well-known example is Ted Turner. He, he was raised in the church, but he became an atheist when he was a young boy. Why? Because God did not answer his prayer. At the time, he had a sister who was very, very ill. And he begged God, please heal my sister, who I love so much. But she died. And when she died, Ted Turner decided there is no God. So he became a firm non-believer. And this is a story that's repeated in so many different lives, so many different people. Many people, when they experience some kind of disappointment, setback, failure, they conclude, they come to the conclusion that, hey, since things did not always go the way I want them to, thus, conclusion, it must mean that there is no God. So they're ultimately, their reasoning comes down to, this is not a perfect world. I know what a perfect world is. So there is no God. Some become atheists because of failed expectations, bad experience. Thirdly, there are those who become atheists for intellectual reasons. Intellectual reasons. Now, here's where I'm going to invite you to really pay attention. Because... Practically all atheists will tell you that they fit in this category. But the truth is, only a very small percentage actually do. Those who are truly in this category are those who, objectively as possible, 
They have weighed the arguments on both sides of the question. And at this present time of this present time, they've landed on the side of non-belief. Okay? So again, connecting it to one and two, this person is not bitter. This person is not angry. This person is not resentful or hostile toward religion. They're not mad at God because, hey, I'm the center of the world and you're not, you're not listening to what I'm telling you to do, God. They're not doing that. But they balanced it out. They looked at both sides. They just believe at this point in time anyway that they just, there is no God. Now, obviously, you know I disagree with their conclusion. But I also believe this, that the more a, a person investigates this subject on an intellectual, honest level, the more likely, notice I say likely, the more likely they are to move in the direction of Christianity. No, no, no. Theism. Theism. Actually, most intellectual, honest atheists are, in reality, what we would call agnostics. So instead of saying, without reservation, there is no God, honest ones, they're more likely to say, you know what, there's really no way of knowing. There's really no way of knowing, but in my opinion, the evidence points in this direction. For example, Carl Sagan, he said this, quote, an atheist has to know a lot more than I know. An atheist is, is someone who knows there is no God. You see what he's saying? He's admitting that. How, how do you, how do you, how do you um, truthfully say that, that you know? Um, let's quote Albert Einstein, he had an interview in Time Magazine, he said this, there are people who say there is no God, but what makes me really angry is that they quote me for support for such views. And then he goes on and says this, it's on the screen, I am not an atheist. The problem involved is too vast for our limited minds as human beings. We are like a little child. We are in a position of a little child who enters this huge library filled with all these books in so many different languages. And a child looks at this and knows that somehow someone must have written all these books, but he does not know how. That, it seems to me, Albert Einstein continues, is that, that is the attitude of the, even the most intelligent human being toward God. We see this universe that is marvelously arranged, obeying certain laws. But the truth is, we only dimly understand these things. Do you see what he's saying? If anyone is leaning toward atheism, I would encourage them to ask yourself, what is truly causing you to lean in that direction? What is the cause? Is it because you're bitter about something or angry about something? Is it because something didn't go the way you wanted it to go? or because the world wasn't created the way you thought it should be? Or is it because you've considered the questions? You, you weighed the arguments. And wherever you land, whether it's here or there, this is the conclusion that makes most sense to you right now. You see, it, it is in this third area where atheism and theism debate should take place. It's not atheism versus whether or not the Bible is true. It's not atheism versus this religion or that religion. It's atheism versus theism, period. That's the first question to settle. 
And this is why books like the book I referenced before, The, the God Delusion, this is why books like that can be so frustrating because the, the author, uh, Richard Dawkins in this case, he has such a hard time focusing on this distinction. His argument against the existence of God, his, his argument against the existence of God often comes down to the behavior of religious people. As if people of one certain religion doing something wrong, and so we admit that, we're not perfect, right? But the argument is that if this people of one certain religion doing something wrong, somehow then conclusion underlying, it disproves the entire concept of the existence of a supernatural being. So it's kind of something like this. It's like saying, I don't believe in math. Why? Because so many people get math wrong. Does that make sense? Or it's like saying, I don't believe in the English language. Why? Because if the English language is real, then why are there so many different dialects, so many different accents, and why do so many people speak it incorrectly? I can prove English isn't real. I can give you thousands of examples of people speaking it wrong, or should I say wrongly. For the teachers, you got, you got a little giggle there, right? Let's, let's bring it home. Let's... I'm sorry for the time. Let's bring it home. The question we must answer. The first question we have to answer, the question of theism or atheism, it's not really a religious question. It's a spiritual question. It's a supernatural question. You either believe that the universe as we see it, you know, and we, we mentioned uh, the, the celestial event that's going to happen tomorrow. You can either believe that the universe created itself that non-existent matter somehow manipulated itself into existence? Or you believe that something is behind it. There's a supernatural, all-powerful deity. I'm not even going to call it God. There's a deity that was behind creation. At this point, you don't even have... You don't even have to have an opinion. Which religion is the right religion? Which religion is God's favorite? No, no, no. It's just a simple either-or proposition. Theism or atheism. So let me ask you. Do you believe in the existence of God? Personally, for me, I will be honest. For me, it was an easy decision. Because fundamentally for me, it was not about religion or the historical reliability of this that we call the Bible or anything else. It was simply a question of which proposition seemed more probable. Am I just an accident? Or is there a meaning to life? Is there a meaning to me and you? Science, of course, cannot explain first cause. First cause, or the origin of all things. Science cannot answer that. It's a question that science cannot answer. How did the world come into existence? Did non-existent matter create itself, or is there something behind it? Let's call it God at this point. Is God the origin of all things? Blaise Pascal, who was a mathematician, physicist, and philosopher, he said it this way. I think it's very, very profound. He said, in faith, there is enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadows to blind those who do not want to believe. What is he saying? Let's be honest. Are you looking for reasons to believe or are you really looking for reasons not to believe? Not to believe. And that's what the Bible is talking about. We don't want God to exist. When you take the first step, the journey becomes, a faith becomes then a journey of discovery. If you believe that God exists, then life becomes all about learning what God is like. Did God simply, did he spin the world into existence and is now watching us from a distance? He's disinterested, he's not involved in us. Or does he care about the people on this planet? Is he willing to intervene in some way? Does he actually love us? And so on and so on. Spoiler alert. I believe that God not only exists, but he does. He, he loves us. He loves you. 
He loves you so much that he wants you to know him personally, to experience his presence in your life in a very personal way. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that you and I, we might know what God is truly like. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It is to this conclusion that my spiritual journey has brought me. I have been in church all my life. My father was an elder. All my life. I've been a Christian, in fact, for a number of years. But the real adventure begins when I said that simple prayer. God, I believe in you. I believe in you. And I want to know you. That faith I profess, for, profess today is my faith. Yes, it is true. I've learned everything I know from teachers and preachers, theologians, thinkers, writers, so on and so on. It is also true that over the years, that faith has become my faith. So, Lord, brothers and sisters, as we embark on this journey, here's the invitation, the main point. God wants each one of you to come to the place where you own your faith where you're not just repeating what you've heard throughout your life, but you are convinced by what you have learned in your journey of discovery with God. This is a journey that God wants all of us to take, every simple one of us, a step of faith in his direction and to pray ultimately the prayer that Moses prayed, Exodus 33, 13. He said on the screen, teach me, O God, your ways so that I may know you and I will continue to find favor with you. So brothers and sisters, I invite you today, all of us, to go back to square one, to say, yes, I believe God is real, and I want my journey, my life, to be a journey of discovering in knowing him. This is my hope, my prayer for all of you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As we invite the praise team forward to lead us in our response song, let us pray together. God, today is this side of the empty tomb and we are in the season called Easter. We want to be people of the resurrection. We want to be Easter people. We want to experience and celebrate hope and joy in our lives. But Lord, we are honest as well that we want to take this opportunity to be a challenge and encouragement to some, if not many of us, who are struggling with the basics of faith. Or whether it really does make sense to believe. God, may today be an invitation point for you to speak to their hearts. I pray through your spirit that you will cause us to have open minds and open hearts to simply look at the evidence we're not forced to, but, then, but to ultimately just come to our own conclusion. And I can honestly, humbly, and faithfully say that because I believe in you. I pray for those who need to hear these words today, and they have heard it, and that today they will embark on a journey of discovery. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we all pray. Amen. Our response song is called, We Believe. Um, so to own this, you can think of, I believe. Um, but if you listen to all the um, lyrics, they're quite profound in that um, uh, one part says, um, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit. He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. And we believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. So I invite you all to stand if you're able. We know it. 
There is only one Join me in our closing prayer. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every single one of us today, as we strive to live as Easter people, people of the resurrection, we confidently can say, I believe. That is my prayer for you. But I also know that some of us, many of us maybe, we struggle. And that's okay. Good for you. I ask of you to simply do the next step. The next couple, few weeks from now, I'll just do my part, my two cents, my limited capability to, to present some things to you. And I pray that each and every Sunday you will come with an open heart and open mind. And you would ask the questions and you do the work. Whatever side of the question you make and land on, that's up to you. But I invite you on this journey. God in heaven, we thank you for a time of worship. We thank you for an opportunity to just be honest before you, to ask questions that we truly need to have answered. And I pray for those who really need to hear today's word, that they will receive it as your word to them. 
It is okay to ask questions because we believe that you are stronger than questions. We believe in who you are and what you have done for us. So we pray for one another, Lord, that each and every one of us can come to that conclusion. Help us, Lord, to be an encouragement and support to one another as we embark on this journey. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, now and forever. Amen. Amen.